If you're a 2D artist, you have a secret weapon in 3D. This video is in partnership with Acer's Concept D, a new line for creator PCs. I'll be using the Concept D7 easel to make all the art in this video, and you'll see some of my favorite highlights of this machine along the way. All right, diligent 2D artist, if I asked you to paint me a ball, you would say, LOL, bro, no problem. There's my background environment. Here's the base color of the ball. Oh, and that's my light direction. Now I know where the cast shadow goes. I can also do the form shadow of the ball using an average shadow value. Yawn. I'll move on to half tones now. See that slick little shape there? <sighs> and here's your average light, and I'm almost done. There's a highlight. And here's your reflected light, also known as ambient light. Oh, silly me, I almost forgot the ambient occlusion and ambient light in the cast shadow. Yep, there it is. Pretty good, huh? Hey, that is pretty good. But can you do that in 3D? Um, no. Well, what if I told you that you can, and with your existing skill set? This is gonna be a three-part video series. We're gonna build a whole project together. Everything will be driven by our existing 2D skills, but we'll be applying them in Blender. The series will have the 2D art fundamentals you expect from me, paired with easy lessons on how to apply them in 3D. First, let me get you started with painting in 3D right now. Load up Blender, of course, and I've created this training scene that you can download. Check the video description. The scene comes in like this. Now, quick navigation, use middle mouse button to orbit your view, shift middle mouse button to move left and right, and control middle mouse button to move in and out, or you can scroll your mouse wheel for that. There are three items in the scene, which you can select simply by clicking on them. This object here is a light, and if I switched into render view with this button, I can grab the move tool over here and move my light source around and see the results in real time. Standard 3D stuff, which we are not going to use. We want to paint the light ourselves. Getting set up for that involves a few button clicks, but it's easy. I'll select the ball and click on the materials icon down here. Step one is setting a material that doesn't react to light. Do that by clicking on this little green circle and choosing emission. Our ball is now a flat color. I'll go to the material name and rename it to ball. And now I want to set up the backdrop the same way. I'll select it and see how this box is blank? That means it doesn't have a material yet. So I'll push new and give it a name here. Then once again, click the green circle and choose emission. All right, both objects are the same color, but we'll fix that right now. In the color box, click the yellow circle and choose image texture. Now click new. This is like creating a canvas. I'll raise the resolution to 2000 by 2000 pixels, uncheck alpha and hit okay. We'll set up the ball the same way, select it, click the yellow circle, image texture, new, and this time we'll change the base color from black to red and press OK. And that's it, we're ready to start painting. I'll find a good starting view here and I'll start with the background. I'll select it and using this corner menu here, switch over to texture paint mode and you are painting in 3D. All your tools are located under this icon. Use your middle mouse button to scroll the panel. If you want a rectangle color picker like this, go up to edit preferences and in the interface tab, change your color picker to this one. All right, so I recommend you do try this training scene to get your feet wet with the interface. The art fundamentals are the same, but the experience of working this way will feel slightly foreign at first. One of the main things is that you have to change your view to paint the scene from different angles. For example, watch this. I'll push F to resize my brush, then I'll paint what looks like a circle. But when I change my view, you can see what I've actually done. The brush strokes are projected from your viewpoint. So if I wanted to, say, paint the cast shadow from this ball, I'd want to do it from this angle, looking more or less straight down to make sure there's no distortion. And I'll continuously change my view as I work to make sure the scene is looking good from every angle. This is for sure the biggest hurdle you'll face. Once you get used to it though, it starts feeling second nature. I recommend mapping one of your stylus buttons to be a middle mouse click. That way you don't have to switch back to your mouse to move around. I want to start painting the ball now. To do that, I need to have it selected. So I'll go back to object mode, select the ball, then return to texture paint mode. Then just painting and moving and painting and moving. I'm using all the fundamentals you saw at the beginning of this video, which of course I've covered in great detail in my other videos. Oh, and I should mention that you sample colors with S. The Concept D screen, by the way, is totally reliable for values and color. This is something that an artist absolutely needs to count on with their device. All right, now that I've whet your appetite with 3D painting, we can start our big art project. 
I'd like to begin, though, with an art fundamentals lesson. My environment for this project will be a graveyard. Graveyards are cool. There's lots of opportunity for overlapping shapes to create depth, and the gravestones themselves are essentially just boxes. Boxes have very clear planes, making them ideal for lighting and value practice. Here in Blender, I have a box, and this is my sunlight direction. The sun is most directly hitting this top plane, so it gets a very light value. The sun is also hitting this plane, though not quite as directly. That's halftone. Halftone is related to the first value because it's in light, though being a tiny step darker reveals its different orientation to the light. The third visible plane does not get hit directly by light. It's in shadow. And to show that, we want to go significantly darker. It's always helpful to solidify these fundamentals with a quick painting. This study is beginner level. It's just a box. But it does force you to do something that advanced painters do. Get those values to look like light. This is your chance to experiment with value groupings. How dark can a halftone get before it starts looking like shadow? How light can a shadow get before it starts looking like light? These are things that good painters develop an innate sense for, and a box is maybe the simplest way to establish it. Back in Blender, I'll grab the sunlight and tilt it so it's more like a late afternoon scenario. Did you see what happened there? The two light values on the box flipped. So this plane is now my lightest value, and the top plane is the halftone value. The shadow plane is still the shadow plane. It hasn't changed. I'm choosing to group my cast shadow here with the form shadow. This helps with easy readability. And I just want to say the Concept D stylus feels really nice. It uses Wacom technology, and its quality is right up there with the larger tablets I use. Alright, so just getting the light on that box feeling solid. Let's try one more. This time, I'll move the light to be coming from behind the box. And look at this. The top plane is now the only visible plane in light. These two planes are in shadow, and look how much they group together. You could paint both planes with one value. If you want a separation in shadow, typically those changes are subtle. That's because, usually, you don't want the shadows to look like they have as much definition as the light. After all, the light is what visually defines things for us. So it stands to reason that you can reduce that in shadow. Keeping the cast shadow value close to the form shadow values emphasizes that. It also helps with a bit of an atmospheric effect. You might have noticed that I was using the Concept D easel feature in three different orientations. This is really one of its strengths. It's able to accommodate your physicality and ergonomics really well. Alright, more value study. I've come up with something here that approximates a graveyard, but I'm going to throw half of it in shadow. Now we really have to think about value groups. This group covers the boxes in light and this group covers the boxes in shadow. However, these two values are the same. This is a common value organization strategy. That is, having the shadow of your light area be the same value as the lightest plane in your shadow area. There's an inherent visual structure to that. So, I'm doing a study of it here, and this one's a step more advanced than just painting a box. Actually, this is a good bridge between a purely fundamental study and something that begins to approximate a full scene. Here's an example from another artist, a fantastic piece by Marcello Vignali. I'll throw a quick filter on it for simplification. Now, the darkest value in the light might be this area here of the girl's skirt, and the lightest part of the shadows might be this, the guy's white shirt. A hair's difference notwithstanding, those two values are the same. Every other value is kept very separate, and that really helps give this piece its strong sense of light and shadow. These are the concepts that are going to keep us grounded as we now enter 3D. Okay, but putting values aside for a second, Blender's Grease Pencil is a great tool that allows us to draw in 3D space. And here's the basics of it. First, let's get rid of this default cube by selecting it, then right click and press delete. Now go up to the Add menu and say Grease Pencil blank. Go up here and switch into Draw Mode. And look at this, I'm drawing. Up here I have Opacity, and then this button toggles pen pressure. Your brushes are all the way over here. Press F to resize your brush. And I'll start this off by sketching in a tombstone. The grease pencil strokes are projected from your view, just like we saw with this example. So don't move your view too much while you sketch. Now, I'll eventually replace this with a 3D model and then paint that 3D model. But because I'm more comfortable with drawing than 3D modeling, for me, this is an essential step. My drawing is tilted due to the view I used. So I'll go into object mode. I'll select my grease pencil drawing, then grab the rotate tool on this toolbar on the left and use this little widget to bring it upright. A fantastic way to edit your drawing is to go back up to the Mode menu and enter Sculpt Mode. 
I can easily tweak proportions, and again use F to resize your brush. Another way to quickly edit your drawing is to jump into edit mode. This allows me to select individual points in my strokes, and using the move tool on the left toolbar, I can simply use the widget and drag those points up. So I will be going back to the grease pencil to draw more of the environment, but let's get into actually modeling this tombstone, and I promise it's easy. Because tombstones are like boxes, we're going to model this from a cube. By default we're in object mode. I can use the toolbar on the left to move, rotate, or scale the object into place. Now I'll go back up to this menu and switch into edit mode, or I can press tab. In edit mode, this button will interact with vertices, which are the points. This button will interact with edges, which are the lines between points. And this button will interact with faces, which is the entire polygon. So in face mode, I'm selecting faces and using the toolbar on the left to move them and scale the faces into place, just following my sketch. Now I'll use the extrude tool, which is right here. One of the most common ways to shape an object. So here, I'll keep that extrusion pretty low and scale it a bit, then extrude that new face up for the main body of the tombstone. You can just press E for extrude, by the way. But my 3D model is obscuring my sketch. That's not cool. So back in object mode, I've selected my drawing and go to this button here. Then in viewport display, click in front. Now our sketch will always be in front of the model. And I'll just continue working on it. Simple extrusions, extrude, scale, move, rinse and repeat. I want this base to be wider. So I'll select these two faces, push S for scale and X to scale on the X axis. Blender's axes are color coded and you can refer to this widget up here to remind you which is which. Okay, that was easy, right? Now the model's looking a little rigid. I wanna add some more character to it. To do that, I need more points to work with. In edit mode, use the loop cut tool here and you can click and drag to add points wherever you want. I only need a few additional loop cuts here. This allows me to go into sculpt mode. I'm using the grab brush and I can continue to shape this thing, again using F to resize my brush. Sculpt mode is great because there's really no 3D skill required here. As a 2D artist, this is so intuitive. Blender has all kinds of sculpt brushes and you should play with them to see what they do. All right, I wanna put some snow on this thing and I've got a fun way to model that. In the add menu, add a new meta ball. This looks like a regular sphere, but I'll go ahead and add another one and look at how they interact. I'll use metaballs to add localized buildups of snow on the tombstone. By the way, if you press the tilde key, you can switch to a different view. These orthographic flat views are really helpful. Using the add menu, I'll make a plane, scale it up, go into edit mode, right click and say subdivide. I'll subdivide four times. That's just another way to generate more points so I can go into sculpt mode and sculpt away at this landscape. Now I've added more metaballs and distributing them around. If you want some visual inspiration as you work, click this button up here, which switches to render view. And with this tab activated, change the render engine from EV to cycles. Oh, and I need to unhide my light. Now I can select that light and move it around. Of course, in the end, we're not actually going to use that light. This is just for nice visual feedback as you work. So I modeled a new gravestone there. Then I pushed shift D to duplicate it placed them accordingly, and also shift D duplicated my meta balls and placing them, the same stuff. At this point, I want to set up a dummy camera, something that's gonna help me establish a frame. To switch to the camera view, press the tilde key, go into view camera, go into the view tab and click on this. That allows me to use the same mouse controls to now move my camera around. And you can see I have my frame. I'll ballpark a good view of the scene because I wanna switch back to my grease pencil to keep drawing this environment. But if I made a new grease pencil blank now, it would start drawing at that little cursor you see in the middle. I wanna move that point. So I'm gonna drag out a new window here. I'll switch into top view, click the 3D cursor tool right there, and now I can move that 3D cursor simply by clicking. Then I made a new grease pencil blank, and here we go blocking out some background elements. Just now I made another grease pencil element a little closer to camera to block out these tombstones. And as you can see, I like to move the camera around while I draw to really sense that depth. The depth that comes for free in a 3D environment. I made another grease pencil blank, this one very close to camera, and obviously this will be a foreground element. I'm thinking a tree cropped off by the frame. And this sense of space and depth is feeling real sweet. Look at that. I feel like our project is at the point now where we have an actual cinematic environment. Or at least, the promise of one. Of course I have to do more 3D modeling to get all this in, but it's all the same stuff you've already seen. 
a lot of box extrusions for the gravestones, switching views to put them in place, sculpting those gravestones to give them character, making a plane, subdividing it, sculpting that for the ground, metaballs for the snow. And at this stage, I'm ready to jump into 3D painting. I've already shown you how to set up a scene for that, but this being a little more complex, there's a few more steps. You'll have to go through every object, go up to Object, Apply, Scale. You can set up a shortcut for this. Right click on Scale and say Add to Quick Favorites. Then if you click on an object and press Q, you can just say Scale. So click an object, Q, Scale, click an object, Q, Scale. It goes by pretty quick. The next thing we need to do is click on a meta ball, which selects all of them. Right click and say Convert to Mesh. Okay, and the last thing we have to do to every object is click it, tab into edit mode, push A to select all the geometry, then push U and click on Smart UV Project. Set island margin to 0.03 and make sure correct aspect is checked and hit okay. Behind the scenes, this makes a handy little map of each part of our model that will be assigned to different parts of our canvas. Okay, so I've prepared the foreground elements of the scene. I also threw in this background plane that I quickly modeled into a half cylinder. And yeah, I can just start painting this. To me, it's so much fun zooming out and painting big strokes, zooming in and painting little details, knowing that everything is dimensionally supported by the 3D geometry. A few things to know about the brush. Go up to this fall off dialog and you have a bunch of presets. This one, for example, is a very hard brush. And this one is a softer brush. Unfortunately, there's no typical layers with this method, but we do have blending modes. They're up here. I'll switch to color dodge, and this should be familiar. I can switch to multiply, and those all act as you'd expect. So I'm working away here. And because in 3D painting, you interact with your scene kind of object by object, one hurdle I face is I find it's easy to become directionless. Like I'm painting, but I don't know what I'm working toward. I need a 2D gut check. So I'm in Photoshop here with a render of my scene before I started the painting. And I'm just gonna sketch around and find a mood for this thing. I'll try adding new elements like a wrought iron fence in the foreground. And maybe some falling snow could disguise those razor sharp edges you tend to get in 3D. I think this adds to the mood and it'll also make for some fun layering and compositing later. The Concept D is powerful. I was switching between modeling and rendering in Blender, painting in Photoshop, not to mention screen recording, and the machine never even broke a sweat. So here's my final mock-up sketch, which in itself is a combination of 2D and 3D. So relating this back to the fundamentals from earlier, I am cleanly separating my planes by putting the foreground in light and the background in shadow. There's also these extreme foreground elements, which are dark. That makes for a simple dark light dark pattern. Also, I'm recalling this diagram. This is one of the shadows from the lit foreground, which is more or less the same value as one of the lighter planes from the shadowed background. It doesn't have to be an exact match. Close in value is just fine. But to bring some added punch, I am introducing a few extreme darks in the lit area that are darker than anything in the background. That little localized boost of contrast helps draw your attention to that focal point. With that figured out, I'm ready to dive into color and back into 3D. But that's in part two. Shout out again to Concept D for sponsoring this series. I'm really enjoying that Concept D7 easel. Thanks also to my patrons, and I'll see you in part two.